Thank you for joining us for the East Mediterranean Business Culture Alliances, the legacy and heritage of the Eastern dance, or as is known in the West, the belly dance. This discussion of an ancient dance form is part of EMCA's dance series of panel discussions. My name is Luke Katsos, EMCA's president, and I will moderate today's panel. A distinguished panel includes author, professor, Stavros Stavru, Karayani, Dean, School of Humanities, Social and Education Sciences of the European University of Cyprus. Author, dancer, Tamalin Dalal. Author, researcher, dance instructor, Heather Ward. Cultural historian, sensory scholar, author, Ainsley Hawthorne. And Panayota Bakis, the director of the Hellenic Arab Folklore Institute. Eastern dance, often referred to in the West as belly dance, is a captivating and culturally rich form of artistic expression that boasts numerous positive aspects. This ancient dance style survived millennia, originating in the East Mediterranean. It offers a, a myriad of benefits, both cultural and physical. Expressing grace and sensuality, it embodies cultural stories, and celebrates communal bonds. This rhythmic dance adorned with vibrant costumes reflects the rich tapestry of Eastern cultures, captivating audiences worldwide with its, uh, with its enchanting allure. First and foremost, it promotes physical well-being while promoting self-confidence and body positivity and encourages self-expression and self-acceptance. It is an excellent form of exercise that enhances flexibility, core strength, and posture. The graceful and fluid movements engage various muscle groups, making it an enjoyable and effective workout. Among its distinctive features is the emphasis on isolations, the controlled movement of specific body parts, such as the hips, torso, and arms. The fluidity of movements and the intricate coordination required are essential elements that contribute to the unique legacy of the Eastern dance. The, root, uh, of the, uh, the roots of the Eastern dance can be traced back to the ancient civilizations with evidence of its existence found in various uh, civilizations across cultures such, such as Egypt, ancient Greece, Turkey, and the Levant, as indicated in, for example, the images that we had for this event, event, which included the third century BCE Hellenic, quote, veil dancer, end quote, bronze statuette from Alexandria at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. While the dance's exact origins remain elusive and perhaps they are from ancient Egypt, it is believed to have originated as a ritualistic dance celebrating fertility, childbirth, and feminine power. The dance gradually evolved, incorporating influences from diverse cultures, as we indicated, and regions, shaping it into the captivating and versatile art form that we recognize today. Throughout history, belly dance has played a multifaceted role in various societies. In the Middle East, it has been uh, and relates to the celebration of life, an expression of joy during weddings and festivals. Simultaneously, it has served as a form of storytelling conveying narratives and folklore through the graceful movements of the dancer. The dance often reflects the cultural and dynamics of the region, offering a visual representation of the community's values and traditions. In the 19th and 20th centuries, which came to be known as the belly dance, when it came to be known as the belly dance, it gained uh, popularity in Western societies during the Orientalist movement. Painters, writers, and travelers romanticized the, ex the exotic allure of the Middle East, contributing to the fascination of the belly dance in Europe and North America. This cross-cultural exchange influenced the dance's evolution, leading to the incorporation of new elements and styles. Despite its widespread popularity, the Eastern dance has faced its share of challenges, including misconceptions and stereotypes. The Western portrayal of the dance as purely sensual or erotic has sometimes, over, has sometimes overshadowed its cultural and artistic significance. 
However, the advocates of the dance have worked tirelessly to dispel those stereotypes, emphasizing the dance's rich history, cultural context, and artistic merit. In contemporary times, the dance has experienced a resurgence with both professional dancers and enthusiasts throughout the world actively participating in its practice and preservation. The dance has adopted to, uh, to modern influences while maintaining its core traditions, creating a dynamic fusion that resonate, resonates with the global audience. Belly dance has become a symbol of empowerment, celebrating uh, body po uh, positivity and enhancing diversity. It has become a form of cultural diplomacy, fostering connections between people of different backgrounds and festivals, workshops and, and collaborations bring together dancers and enthusiasts, uh, creating a global community united with a shared appreciation for this ancient art form. I'd like now to start our, uh, our, our individual panel discussions, and we're going to start with uh, Stavros uh, Karajanis. Uh, he is a professor of English at, uh, at the European University of Cyprus. He is also a performer and creative uh, uh, writer. He has researched and published on belly dance as well as presented and performed it in international conferences. His book, Dancing, Fear and Desire, Race, Sexuality, and Imperial Politics in Middle Eastern Dance, uh, reprinted in uh, 2005, 2007, 2010, uh, uh, reveals the intricate ways in which this controversial dance has been shaped by Eurocentric models that define and control identity performance. He is also the co-author of uh, Sexual Interactions, the, the Social Construction of Atypical Sexual Behaviors, and co-author of Vernacular Worlds, Cosmopolitan Imagination, which came out in uh, 2015. Welcome, Stavro, and thank you for being with us today. Thank you, thank you. I'm very happy to be, uh, I was gonna say on the show, I'm very happy to be on the panel <laughs> and, and very happy to be, to be part of this activity, which, um, by the way, that's a fantastic introduction. That's a great overview that you've thank given you, us. There were several moments that I wanted to pick up on. Um, and I will, you you called it a rhythmic dance. It, it gives me a nice opportunity to begin with my commentary. Uh, rhythmic dance, yes, it is. I mean, it relies on rhythm, especially drum solos, as as my, you know, my fellow panelists will know very, very better than me, for sure. Uh, but also it, 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 it also, the effect of the dance also depends on the exchange between the, the more flowing movements, especially when, when it's a taxim, when it, uh, when it's the flutes, and you know, uh, and and the exchange, the alternating between that and the more rhythmic movements, and that creates quite uh, quite an effect. You mentioned cultural diplomacy, and you reminded me of um, of something I read somewhere. My eye caught it that when many many years ago in the seventies, when Henry Kissinger was visiting Egypt, they invited Najwa Fouad. Nagwa pronounced in Egypt, Nagwa Fuad uh, to perform. And she didn't want to because Nagwa Fuad was Palestinian. And Henry Kissinger was the prime minister, who died very recently, actually. He was the, the minister of um, um, foreign affairs uh, of the US. And, and Nagwa Fuad was a very political person, of course. And she was very resistant to performing for, uh, for Kissinger. Um, you mentioned East and West, if I'm not mistaken, and I've always been struck by the ambivalence that a lot of Greek people have towards belly dancing. Uh, in a sense, if I can speak as a Greek, and whatever that might mean, because I don't think that there is one kind of Greekness. I think that Greekness is, is a construct which, which is built on, it's performative, like Judith Butler's gender. So if I can speak from a Greek perspective, I think that we claim it and we own it. And at the same time, we don't claim it and we don't want to own it uh, in the sense that we have given up a lot of our traditions, a lot of our cultures in favor of a, a more solid Western identity, the way we imagined it, which may not necessarily conform to anything really, but we've given up a great deal. We've made our sacrifices. Now, another point I want to make, we have, I think, two or three minutes, Lou, is that, is that right? Oh, you have 10 minutes. Yeah, wait, 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 wait. I have 10 nobody's minutes. Nobody's rushing you. Nobody's rushing you. Oh, because I was rushing to get through my No, point. no, no. Nobody's rushing you. No, no, no. We're okay. sitting here chatting. We're sitting here chatting. No. 
All right. The um, the next the next thing I wanted to share with uh, with the panel and with the people who are watching us is that for me, um, belly dancing, raksharki, whatever you want to call it, was the greatest revelation in my life, and it was the closest uh, the closest revelation I've had of art having a soteriological role in our lives from uh, Sodiras, in other words, the, 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 the one who saves you, um, because it saved me from a great deal. And, and it saved me uh, in the sense that it taught me a new relationship with my body. It's not just for women. Usually the, the myth is that it's for a woman's body, as if all women have the same bodies. Anyway, that's an aside. But, we, and, and it's, but for men also, it, it, can, it can lead to all kinds of um, revised relationships with your body, with the way you imagine your existence in the world, uh, your, your, um, uh, the, 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 your personality in terms of uh, gesture, a gesture in the larger sense of the term. Um, and uh, I feel very, very fortunate that, that I came into it even late uh, in my life. And the last uh, thing I want to say, because I'm anxious to hear my co-panelists, I'm anxious to hear them. I have a feeling that they have a great deal to tell us, uh, which, is, which is quite important and which certainly I want to hear. Um, I, want to make, uh, I want to mention uh, the concept of art as truth, um, because even though truth is a contested term and people often don't like to touch that's the term truth because it's it, because it you know it varies and and your truth is not necessarily my truth and narratives vary and it depends on whose side you're on and whose uh, whose narrative you want to speak but i believe that there is truth in art and it's that moment when the artistic uh, embodiment resonates with who you are your personal history and when you put your body in motion, when you dance, in other words, you're setting your entire history in motion. This is why in the, in the Middle East, the greatest performers were not the youngsters. It was not like ballet where you, to be a great performer, you have to be in your 20s, mid 20s, 30s. To be a great performer in Egypt, in Lebanon, uh, you had to be in your late 40s, 50s, and you were greatly valued because you were bringing into the dance all that experience from life. All you were bringing to the dance your truth. I believe in the term truth when it comes to the personal dimension. The art um, uh, is is able to reveal to yourself as an art practitioner first and foremost, and then to the people you're sharing your art with uh, is able to reveal great important meanings about your being in the world and how you can take your imagination further through, in the case of Oriental dance, uh, through gesture and through the composition of the movement and bringing the, body to, bringing the body to speak the music and at the same time um, resonate with your past and hopefully how you look to your shared future with, with humanity, I guess. Thank you. <laughs> Sarah, I, I have to I have to add a couple of a couple of uh, comments based on, on what you said. Um, you, you're, you're correct. In many cases, we we forgot uh, to a certain degree that uh, the the belly dance, let's say, which is what is called in the West, is part of our tradition, because many people don't realize that that our people were throughout the Middle East, obviously, from from the ancient from the ancient days. And uh, in, in mainland Greece, which is really was only a small part, a small part of the, let's say, the Hellenic popu uh, population until uh, 1923, when they had the exchange of population. Actually, there was more Greeks outside of what is now uh, Greece uh, than, than within, within the nation. So what, what happened, what happened is in the East, Okay, in the East, obviously the Greeks were continuing to dance the belly dance, etc. When the exchange of population happened, they brought back actually uh, the dance that uh, was part of was part of their tradition. And one of the things this may sound crazy to everybody, but one of the things that um, that uh, you know that I really wanted to have this particular event had to do with a work of art that I mentioned earlier, a work of art at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. 
and that was the Veiled Dancer, okay, which was Helen. It was a Hellenistic statuette, third century B, uh, BCE, uh, in Alexandria. And when you look at this particular statue, it's like unbelievable that that it that there's been no change. There's been no change in like two and a half thousand years or what have you. And then they also have um, in terracotta. They have various statuettes. Uh, one uh, Panayota is in the uh, in the Boston Museum of Fine Arts, uh, which is a, fi a fifth uh, century statuette of a veiled dancer. And Panayota, you'll like this from the Pontos region, actually. And then uh, at the Metropolitan Museum, there's another terracotta statuette that's from Biotia, okay, within within Greece itself from the third century BC. So. Uh, what I'm trying to drive at, I think, is, is exactly your point. It's part of certainly part of our culture. Many people forget that uh, that we were from the East. We are people of the East and not just people of, uh, of Western Europe, as was sometimes uh, portrayed or people try to swing us into that particular uh, direction. You, mess you mentioned uh, Kissinger. And uh, I think uh, I think the dancer was correct. Uh, uh, you coming obviously from Cyprus, I, I'm sure you have your own concepts of Kissinger and, and the unfortunate uh, invasion in, uh, in, 19, 1974. in 1974. Yeah. Okay, with that, I'd like to introduce our, uh, our next panelist, uh, Tamalin Dalal, began her belly dancing career in 1976. She toured South America, dancing for Arab communities throughout the continent from 1984 to 86 then founded and directed the Mid-Eastern Dance Exchange, a nonprofit organization, dance school of, uh, and performing company in Miami Beach. It ran from 1990 to 2007, where she taught and, men and mentored many dancers who became well-known and formed careers of their own. Hundreds also studied for the sheer joy of dance and its benefit for uh, mind uh, and body and spirit. Uh, Ms. Dalal has performed uh, and or taught in 44 countries and was one of the original belly dancing superstars. She has written four books, produced uh, two music CDs of Africa's oldest orchestra, the Ikwan Safa Musical Club, uh, Club of Zanzibar, and filmed ethno, uh, ethnological uh, dance documentaries, uh, Zanzibar Dance, Trance, and Devotion, uh, was completed in uh, 2011, uh, and she released Ethiopia Dances for Joy in uh, 2013. Every year from 2003 until COVID-19 uh, caused the dancing to move online. Tamalin uh, traveled to Asia to teach and dance for extended periods. She taught uh, a month-long workshop in Shanghai in China every year for 10 years and taught regularly in Japan, Thailand and Indonesia, as well as periodically in Malaysia, Singapore, the Philippines, Taiwan, and South Korea. She now lives in New Orleans, Louisiana, where she teaches classes on Zoom and weekly in-person classes, as well as out-of-town workshops. Welcome today, and thank you for being with us today. Thank you. <laughs> Can you wait one second after you get water? I'm getting. You, uh, well, we'll allow you to get water, of course. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> of course, of course. Oh, and I like I like what's on the walls, by the way. Very, very nice. Yeah, yeah very nice. Oh, beautiful. Excellent. Yeah, my cough just decided to come back. I've been fighting a cold. Um, so now I'm thank ready. you, thank you for being with us today. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Okay, so um, this dance has directed my life. I've been doing it since I was seventeen, <clears throat> and I would, if it wasn't for this, I would have gone into fashion design. But I did anyway because I designed my own costumes, especially in the. 80s and early 90s when when costumes weren't available to purchase as easily as they are now and so um when I got into this dance I didn't know what I was getting into I used to take any kind of dance class 
and I love different cultures. I actually did some Persian dance before I started quote belly dancing. And um, through that, I became interested in Middle Eastern cultures. And, um, and so I took this belly dance class, not even knowing what it meant. And I was hooked right away, mainly by the music. Um, the movements were very difficult for me to learn. Um, it took about six years of study before I decided to do anything professional with it. Um, but that was back around eight, 1982, I became professional and started traveling and dancing at parties and this and that. So my perspective, I had been around a lot of Middle Eastern people. Um, people hiring me for events would very often be from, from the Arab, Arab community. And But I didn't realize I was only seeing, like, it wasn't like the Arab world. It was the Arab community. So... It would be um, mostly majority Christian um, people that had their own businesses were fairly well to do, and and that's that was my view, and and um, I was very much embedded with the, with the culture at that time, um, and supported by people of the culture. Um, I started my studio because I. I actually felt that in American society, people would degrade the dance and it gets degraded anyway, even in the Middle East, anywhere. Somehow it lends itself to being degraded and kind of insulted. You know, um, people thinking that like totally misunderstanding what it's about and thinking it's a dance that's less than the other dances that there's something shameful about it, something not to be taken seriously, that you're just, you know, somebody cute. Um, so when I went to Egypt for the first time was 1990, and I saw I saw I saw and I was like, they were so larger than life. I had seen them on videos, but when I saw them in Egypt, they were like household names. They were in the movies, they were in the television. They were um, people that were really seen as artists. And so when I came back to Miami, that's why I lived in Miami at that time. I thought, you know, I need to start something so people will think of what we do as artists because this dance has totally changed my life. Um, so I started my studio. So I was educating people, but I don't feel like I had a full education about the dance. I was dancing. I was dancing for a living. I was. It was my life experience and my lived experience. Um, I didn't realize it was the tip of the iceberg. Um, but I was sharing it as much as best I could. And um, people were learning and people were getting a lot out of it, you know. And one of the things that I feel about the dance is that when I would do shows, let's say I dance at a wedding, and I would see people like, you know, maybe some people they didn't have they weren't as close to the family or maybe different people didn't get along or whatever. I had the power as a dancer and an entertainer to bring everybody together to make that wedding memorable, not just because of me, but by, by how I interacted with people and got people to interact with each other. It went way beyond the dance technique or what I looked like or what I danced like. And that was the most gratifying part when, when, like, I remember one wedding where you could tell the bride and groom's families, they didn't really like each other that much. By the end of the show, I got people up dancing with each other. I just had it all mixed up. And um, 
I feel that this dance has a power to do that. And it's very organic. Well, then when I decided, like, um, you know, we started all these wars in the Middle East and all kinds of trouble. And people were so Islamophobic. And I had been around Muslim people. Actually, I had been married to a Muslim man. So I knew something. But I decided, you know, what is being said about them by our media and by our politicians so that's at that time around 2003, 2004, did not seem like it resonated. So I went, that's when I did this book, 40 Days and a Thousand One Nights. And I went to five different Muslim countries. Mm. <laughs> oh my gosh, there's a reflection. Anyway, I went to five Muslim countries. I wasn't researching dance. My idea was just to write a travel journal, what it's like for a single woman to stay 40 days in Jordan, in Egypt, Siwa Oasis, in Indonesia, mostly in Aceh, um, and in Zanzibar and Xinjiang in Western China, and just write honestly what happened to me and what I saw and what I experienced and who I met. And of course, wherever you go, if you're a dancer, you're gonna find dancing, you're gonna find music. So of course I wrote about it because that's what I was interested in, but I wrote about the people, the everyday problems, whatever. I wasn't looking for terrorism. So consequently, I didn't find any terrorists either. And, and basically people are just human beings. We're all with, of different cultures and, and there's humanity throughout the world. And so on that level, that's what the book was about. But because I was dancing wherever I went, I was not performing. I was just dancing with people I met and you know the hip scarves would come out and we'd start dancing and i said to myself you know i used to tell my students or i used to say in interviews that this is a dance you know with all this ritualistic history of childbirth and this and that and then i said you know i don't know that i mean maybe it is maybe it isn't but what i do know is that it's a social dance and there's so many people throughout the world that are dancing, you know, Sharki, that are dancing Belidi, they're dancing Shiftatelli among each other that are not performing, that nobody knows about them. The people are dancing around the world and they're dancing this dance that's so unifying and so enjoyable, it, like you enjoy your body, you enjoy the music. Um, and I'm like, if people ask me about the background of this dance, yes, we can go very deep, but I see it as it's the social dance. I feel that that is the key. And of course it goes into, we have performance, we have commercial performance, we have now internet performance, we have um, theater performance, which is relatively new in the grand scheme of things. We have the movies, we have all that stuff. But when we get down to it, it's social. It's, you know, it's what we do with our friends, what um, or what people do together. So that was my experience, really a takeaway from that Travel year traveling and writing the book. Um, I do. I hope. Tell me if I'm get, using up too much time. Um, but I did want to mention there was a big, big change in this dance in the early 2000s. There was the second of the booms in the West. The first boom was in the 70s, and the second boom was in the 2000s. And it was so interesting because. I had my studio in Miami and it would just plug along. We'd have our classes and stuff. It never really, you know, it just squeaked by. Suddenly, first Shakira, you know, became famous and, and danced all over the world with her singing. Second, there was a very famous television show called Clone. 
and it was from Brazil, but got translated into Spanish and I believe some other languages. And people, it, the main character, she was a Moroccan woman and they would show her dancing in every single show. So that became this huge boom. Like I had to, I had to double the size of my studio because of that TV show. And then after, there was the belly dance superstars right after that. And they got the CDs and DVDs like in shops all over the world. And also those, they got bootlegged all over the world. So like when I was in the market in Canal Kalili in Cairo, I saw them playing bootleg versions of Belly Dance Superstars DVDs. And it was like, wow, you know. And then there are the big festivals in Egypt. So among all those things, back to back to back, it became this explosion, this huge boom. And it happened so fast all over the world in many cultures that a lot of people just had like a bootleg version of a DVD or saw a TV show. They put together what they could and started hire, bringing dancers, just whoever they could that had a name, like especially from belly dance superstars, bringing them to wherever they lived. And, you know, it became very commercial. It was something, there was a lot of love behind it, but a lot of misunderstanding and commercialism. And with that, then there was, you know, the fusion, which was oftentimes they call fusion confusion, but um, which wasn't really fused. It was like a whole bunch of stuff put together that to American music or to Mongolian or to whatever music. So it started, it got so far from the culture. It became this orientalized thing that, was a huge boom all over the world instead of the thing that really was oriental and oriental or orientalized you know are two different things and um it was disturbing and then it got it got just totally muddled up and mixed up um and then i thought to myself wow you know all these people you know, in all the places that I went, they dance and this is their dance. And then to see how far and how quick it will change, it changed to become this mushed up thing that's very commercial. And it sort of, then it suddenly, well, it started deflating slowly. During the pandemic, it kind of like, you know, completely it deflated a lot. And then different voices came out because everybody was just on their computer. And so like kind of a restructuring of how this dance is going to move forward. Meanwhile, with all that restructuring, with all the commercialism and everything, there's still the people of the many cultures dancing as they always have and they always will, really not aware of our struggles as outsiders doing this dance. Yeah, it's like we're, and not that they need to be aware. And many times the people of this more commercialized or outside dance world are not aware of the people that are dancing in their homes, that this dance, it, I mean, the dance stays steady even, you know. Um, and so, but it's two different worlds completely. Yeah, that's. Let me let me let me ask you a question. When you went to these to some of these foreign countries, you weren't going there obviously to perform or what have you, is what you indicated. You, so so basically, when you met up with people, decided to go partying or dancing or what have you, uh, you introduced to them the belly dance. Is that was that it? You were dancing belly dancing, or what were you doing? No, um, I was writing my book. Oh, and, so it was purely a writing of the book scenario, analyzing the different cultures. Yeah, I was writing, not even to analyze, just to write down my experiences to, okay. to, to see if there were terrorists behind every bush or not, and <laughs> if there weren't. But meanwhile, 
I ended up, you know, meeting, meeting people. Let's say you go to their wedding, people get up and dance socially. So, of course, I did too. Sometimes, of course, we got to know each other. I'm, I'd meet people and they're like, what do you do? And I tell them about my dance. And then there were times that, like, for example, in Zanzibar, I was, I, I did teach lessons to my neighbors. They were, they knew what I did. And then they would see the old Egyptian movies because Egyptian movies went far and wide. And they're like, I used to teach on the roof of our apartment building and not for money or anything. It's just, you know, women and children come up and we lay out a mat and we'd be dancing and very casual. And but they knew hip drops, they knew certain things mostly from those Egyptian movies. Very and yeah, yeah. And many places I went just organically, you know, they figure out what I do and they're like, oh, I want to see it, I want to see it. Or yeah. people would just be dancing in their house and it's like put a scarf here and dance and I dance. And then sometimes they'd be like, oh, this American, she's really good. I'm going to take her down to the neighbor's house. And, you know, sometimes I get kind of par paraded around and shown off, not wearing my costume or anything, just as me and my regular clothes. Thank you so much for that. Thank you again. Our, our next panelist is uh, Heather D. Ward. Uh, she's um, a Middle East dance instructor, performer, and researcher based in St. Louis, Missouri uh, in, uh, in the U.S., Heather has been conducting pioneering research into the history and development of Egyptian belly dance. Her investigations into the transition from uh, uh, Walim and quote, <laughs> Gawazi dance styles to classical rocks uh, Sharky at the turn of the uh, 19th and 20th century led to the publication of her first book, Egyptian Belly Dance in Tra Transition, The Rock Sharky Revolution, 1890 to 1930, in, two, in 2018. Her next book, Rocks in the City, The Belly Dance uh, Landscape of Cairo, explores the historical interconnection between dance, dancers, and the Cairo landscape, and is slated for publication this coming year in 2024. More information about Heather and her research is available on her website, and I'll allow uh, at the end, Heather, if you can, just give us your website. Thank you, sure. Heather, for being with us today. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. And I'm really, really honored to be a, a part of this wonderful panel. And I am going to immediately demonstrate what a nerd I am by sharing my screen and beginning a PowerPoint. <laughs> because I find that it helps me to stay on track. Um, and essentially what I wanted to do in uh, the time available to me today is to offer you a bit of a snapshot of uh, my research and uh, in the last few years and ongoing because as the other researchers on this panel know, it never ends. <laughs> and I want to start off um, by offering a, a definition because um, this word belly dance in the English language uh, gets used in sometimes a way that muddies the waters about what exactly we're talking about. I think in the Western world, the word is used very generally to subsume a lot of dance styles that while bearing similarities, aren't always closely related. And uh, so to be clear, I always start my presentations with the qualifier that what I'm talking about is Egyptian belly dance. That's where my research focuses. So that's all that really I feel I can speak intelligently towards. And what I mean when I say Egyptian belly dance is a collective of dance forms because even when we're talking about Egyptian belly dance, that term is not simple because this term includes the traditional dances of professional entertainers uh, from Egypt, including the Awalim, the Gawazi, 
and a variety of others. Um, it includes the theatrical form of belly dance, the most, probably the most recognizable form of Egyptian belly dance internationally, which uh, we will call Raksharki for purposes of this. And then you have the social dance that is the foundation for all of this, which is just the way that ordinary Egyptian people dance. But confusingly, that does vary from place to place within Egypt. So now, among other things that I have been working on in my uh, research into Egyptian dance history is this question of ancient origins, because it's something that gets discussed a lot, both inside and outside Egypt. And um, it's, it's problematic from a research standpoint. We have every reason to suggest that the social dance is indeed very, very old. And I'll point, for example, to Roman era artistic and literary descriptions that have been documented, documented by Andrea Deegan, who's a great uh, researcher to look into. You wanna uh, have a, a classic scholar perspective on what does belly dance really mean in the ancient world? Um, but when we get into the history of the professional variants of the dance, uh, the dances of the Awalam, the Hawazi, uh, other male performers, uh, Rock Sharky, it's a lot more complicated. And while we can find examples of professional entertainers who played roles similar to modern day Egyptian belly dancers in uh, the early centuries after the Arab conquest, um, there, there's a lot to suggest cultural continuities from after that era, from medieval Egypt to modern Egypt. Uh, it's very suggestive of continuities in music and dance traditions, but it's a lot harder to extend those continuities back before the Arab conquest. It's important to understand after the Arab conquest, the Arabization and Islamicization of Egypt took place very, very quickly, very quickly. And while certainly, certainly, certainly that uh, not all vestiges of the earlier Egyptian civilization disappeared, um, there were dramatic linguistic and cultural transformations that took place. So because of all that, it's very challenging to draw a lineal connection back from modern day belly dance in Egypt to entertainers from the Pharaonic and Greco-Roman periods. So I usually don't bother. <laughs> um, the other question uh, that I'm constantly looking into in my research is this issue of Western influence. Was there, how much, what form did it take? Now, I mentioned at the outset that for foreigners, the most familiar of the professional forms of Egyptian belly dance is Raksharki. This is the stage form of belly dance that I think most Westerners will recognize with the beads and the sequins and the bare navel and all that. Now, this dance form emerged at the turn of the 19th and 20th centuries. It's a very young incarnation of the dance and it emerged through the deliberate hybridization of traditional Egyptian belly dance styles, namely those Awalim and Gawazi that I keep mentioning, and foreign elements, uh, foreign elements of um, posture, movement vocabulary, uh, theatrical conventions, the use of choreography, all of these uh, merged into the dance at this turn of the century time frame, But, and there's always a but, <laughs> it's important to realize that contrary to uh, sort of popular understandings about this transition, Egyptians did not create this staged form of belly dance with foreign consumers in mind. And I think the most the simplest illustration of that is when we go back and we look at the advertising for the shows, 
most of it's in Arabic. <laughs> and most of the uh, European and American visitors to Egypt at that time, or the occupiers, the British occupiers uh, at the turn of the century, were not bilingual and could not read Arabic. So uh, in point of fact, the dance embodied Egyptian aesthetics and agendas as they struggled to assert their cultural national identity under occupation. There is a lot of nationalism, Egyptian nationalism that is pervasive in the cultural production of Egyptian artists and entertainers at this period, not just in dance, but in music, musical theater, literature, and so on. So we have to take that into account. Um, although the dance incorporated foreign elements, this is undeniable, absolutely undeniable. Egyptians accepted the dance as an authentic part of their cultural heritage, and they do to this day, in spite of the foreignness of some of the elements of it, including the costume, by the way. Now, another point I'd like to uh, touch on um, that I think is very important uh, for, for non-Egyptians to understand is the marginality of professional dancers in Egyptian society. This marginality in Egypt is tied to notions of gender and class. And uh, in terms of gender, it's important to understand that professional belly dancers are routinely transgressive of gender norms. So female dancers deploy uh, their bodies, which are perceived as sexually potent, outside of proper social contexts, outside of the marital union, et cetera, where male belly dancers engage in behaviors and attire that are perceived as effeminate by the definitions within Egyptian culture, which are not necessarily the same, by the way, as the definitions outside of Egyptian culture. More on that in a bit. And also belly dance is generally viewed as a low status and undesirable occupation. And because of that, many dancers hail from lower class backgrounds. And if you talk to most belly dancers or uh, explore the backgrounds of a lot of the professional belly dancers uh, who are even big names, many of them did not enter into the trade by choice, but by necessity, okay? And even those who achieve great celebrity never really escape the stigma of the profession. Um, nevertheless, these individuals are considered vital to many events and many celebrations, uh, including the most intimate of occasions such as weddings. Now, because of this marginality um, and their existence as sort of liminal figures in the society, dancers, professional dancers have been the subject to frequent crackdowns by the Egyptian authorities and policing by the authorities. And this is not new. So we have evidence going back to the Mamluk era of uh, government intervention against uh, entertainers, uh, dancers. In the Ottoman era, we have numerous examples um, long before the most famous instance, which is uh, Muhammad Ali's ban of uh, female dancers and prostitutes in the 1830s. So there's a long history of the government intervening uh, with regards to professional dancers. Now I mentioned with regards to marginality, uh, male and female belly dancers, because there's a misconception outside of Egypt and even among some in Egypt that this is a feminine dance uh, rooted in uh, constructs of femininity and uh, 
the mother goddess archetype and things of this nature. But in reality, there is a long, long, long history of male involvement in the dance in Egypt. Um, now, in the present day, this is uncommon, except for a few who work in tourist areas and in the international dance workshop and festival industry. Uh, so it's not super common in Egypt today, but the history is undeniable. So if we go back to the medieval era, we have entertainers who were known as the Mokhanathun. Uh, these were a social class of male entertainers who assumed female mannerisms and dress, but to be clear, they were not seen as female impersonators, they were recognized to be men. These entertainers existed all over the Islamic world and after the Islamic conquest of Egypt became part of the traditional entertainment milieu of Egypt. In the Ottoman and Khedivial periods, we have entertainers known as the Jenk, that's a loan word from Turkish, by the way. And the howl, which is an Arabic word, which in the present day is not a polite term. Just a heads up about that. Like their predecessors, these men assumed female mannerisms in dress, and they were wildly popular. Uh, the Egyptian chronicler al Damardashi describes how the Ottoman governor of Egypt, Ismail Basha, in the 17th century, hired a famous male dancer and his troupe to perform at the celebration of uh, the circumcision of his two sons. So we have lots and lots of documentation of male entertainers throughout Egyptian history. This is an individual uh, from the early 20th century named Hussein Fuad. Uh, in the in the modern era, these individuals were just simply known as raqas, raqas meaning dancer. And uh, male dancers like Hussein were a common sight in the first half of the 20th century. We have examples from uh, popular festivals called Mawalid, as well as in the early entertainment venues of urban Cairo in the 20th century. Now, the last thing I want to mention, because I don't want to take too much time, uh, is uh, in my research, I also spend a lot of time trying to uh, raise awareness of the less visible uh, Egyptian dancers, not only by uh, educating about, for example, what I just mentioned, male belly dancers, but um, the dancers who are less visible outside of Egypt because of, uh, it's too much to get into really now, but uh, the kind of biases that exist in the industry about what's a proper belly dancer. And in Egyptian culture, uh, the vast majority of professional dancers entertain for the lower classes in settings that are not visible on social media, as opposed to the big names who are highly visible on uh, television, in movies, and by way of social media. These dancers are the ordinary dancers who perform at the weddings of the ordinary people. So I'm showing you some screen grabs of some of these performers. And one of the reasons that they're less visible among foreign consumers of the dance is they don't fit the aesthetics that we've come to expect of a certain body type, a uh, certain way of costuming, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so these are the real deal. These are the sorts of dancers who perform in, the, in Egyptian reality. So these are urban settings uh, on the, these are urban settings as well. And by the way, I'll add that, um, you know, especially in the West, uh, 
there, I remember this when I was a beginner, there was a, a beginner student. There was a mantra that teachers always used to say, belly dance is sensual, not sexual. But I'm here to tell you in Egyptian culture, there are a lot of sexual connotations to belly dance. It's expected, especially in wedding contexts, because the dancer can convey things that polite women cannot. So there is a lot of sexual innuendo in the dance. Um, and, and it's something we really can't deny when we look at what's really happening in these kinds of settings. And lastly, I'm showing you a couple of rural entertainers. Uh, the dancer on the left, Um Hashem, I've had the opportunity to learn from her a few times. And again, these dancers are just not visible because they don't fit the uh, international stereotype of what a belly dancer looks like. So those are just a few points of, uh, and here again, Um Hashem and another dancer, Manel. Those are a few points I wanted to illustrate um, because a lot of my work is about myth busting and really raising an awareness of Egyptian cultural realities of this dance. Thanks for the time. I appreciate it. Uh, Heather, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you so much for that. Uh, a lot of the conversation was about professional dancers, but in, in terms of the Egyptian culture, um, the the belly dance, let's say, is that a common dance where people dance with their, you know, with their relatives when they get together and things like that, like other cultures in the Middle East? 100%. So there's a big divide in perception between dancing socially and dancing professionally. And I don't want to be hyperbolic and say all Egyptians dance, but most Egyptian people in private settings enjoy dancing and this is their social dance. Although again, there is variation, whether you're in urban Cairo or you're in rural Mansoura, yeah. what form the social dance takes, but absolutely. But Lord forbid that your sister or your daughter become a professional. Well, that, that, that's a different scenario in different cultures, as we know. Uh, I, will, I will add one thing. You said that there was a break in your research in terms of the ancient to the more modern and uh, trying to find the linkage. I, I would suggest, you know, this is just my suggestion. I would suggest that what, what happened during, during the period is not so much the belly dancing didn't exist. It, it went to a certain degree more private, in particular when you had, for example, Christianity, which came to the East around the time period of the fourth century and, and beyond, where in fact, those type of dances would absolutely uh, not fit into the particular society that existed within Egypt at the time, because they were obviously Orthodox and they were, they were um, uh, monophysites and uh, they were pretty radical in terms of, of their religion. So I think, I think that break, if, I think if you did a study on actually that break period that you were talking about, I think you would find that it exists, but probably more underground and not, in fact, uh, within society that had radically changed you know, religiously uh, within, within Egypt at the time. With that, I'd like to introduce uh, uh, another one of our, our panelists in this fascinating discussion that we, that we are having. Uh, Ainsley uh, Hawthorne, uh, PhD, is a dancer, cultural historian and dance scholar based in uh, St. John's, Newfoundland and uh, Labrador. After completing her doctorate in Near Eastern Languages and Civilizations at Yale, she was a fellow uh, of the Advanced Seminar in the Humanities at Venice International University and of Distant Worlds, the Graduate School of Ancient Studies at Ludwig Maximilian University of Munich. Today, as a, a public scholar, she writes for publications like uh, CB, uh, CBC, uh, Psychology Today, and The Dance Current uh, uh, gives note, uh, noteworthy speeches, keynote and worthy speeches on a variety of topics and has been quoted by media outlets throughout the world. A dance practice focuses on Egyptian, Roxa uh, uh, Sharki, and folkloric dance. 
Her scholarship, which has been published in Dance Research, the Journal of Intercultural Studies and Researches in Dance, among others, uh, cons considers the sensory aspects and linguistic context of Middle Eastern, North African, Hellenic, and Turkish dance. Thank you for being with us today, Ainsley. Thanks again. Thank you so much, Lou, for the kind introduction and for inviting me to be part of a panel with uh, so many scholars and dancers that I have tremendous respect for. So I'm delighted to be here today. Uh, as Lou said, one of my primary areas of research is language. And my particular interests are etymology, which is the study of uh, word origins, historical linguistics, which is the study of how language evolves over time, and sociolinguistics, which looks at uh, the role that language plays in society and how language influences uh, social interactions and the way we think. So you might ask, what does all this have to do with dance? Uh, well, what we call the dance and its movements affects the way that uh, we think about this art form and the cultures where it originates. So in my research, that's what I've been uh, particularly interested in looking at. Before the panel started today, we were having a little chat about uh, the meaning of legacy and heritage. Before uh, we began today and when I was uh, preparing for today's panel, uh, because of that topic, what it brought uh, to mind for me was the background of the dance and the way that it uh, is perceived in society today. So the legacy, how does it um, affect our modern society and how will we move with it into the future? So the part of my research I thought I would focus on is uh, the origin of the name belly dance. Uh, and you'll note that even in the title of the, the panel, the way you've um, worded it today is Eastern dance slash belly dance. And I would say that that sort of portrays a common discomfort in the dance field in general with the term belly dance, we're skeptical of it. And there are several reasons for that. Um, one of them is that it doesn't resemble what the dance is called in its cultures of origin. So we've already said in Arabic, it's called Raksharki, in Turkish, it's called Oriental Tans. Both of those translate to Eastern dance or Oriental dance. Um, it's Siftateli in Greek, uh, which comes from the Turkish word shiftateli, meaning double stringed, which actually refers to a style of violin playing. So this word belly dance or term belly dance is disconnected from those uh, terms that are being used in the cultures where the dance is actually practiced traditionally. Another problem with the term is that it focuses on one part of the dancer's anatomy when this dance form not only engages the whole body, but also requires musicality, uh, cultural awareness, knowledge of folk dance. Uh, so it's a very kind of reductive term. And thirdly, as some of the other speakers have already alluded to, it conflates a very broad variety of different dance forms uh, into just one. So Heather was talking about, you know, uh, the dance of the Awalim and the dance of the Gawadzi, and you have uh, rural dance forms versus urban dance forms. You have what uh, people do socially and what people do on stage. Those all look different from each other. And when we use the term belly dance as kind of a catch-all term, we're sort of neglecting all the intricacies and variations in the case of what Heather was talking about just within Egypt let alone when we're talking about all the other cultures where this dance is actually practiced. And lastly, uh, and perhaps this is what makes uh, most English speakers uh, uncomfortable, is that the word belly has embarrassing connotations. So it's silly. It's associated with things like belly laugh, uh, belly flop. Uh, it's demeaning it you know yellow belly go belly up a uh, beer belly it has these kind of like negative associations and it's also suggestive because the abdomen is a part of the body that's usually concealed so all of those things when we use uh the term belly dance to speak about this uh family of dance styles in the eastern mediterranean affect the way the dance is viewed um, and Tamlin said it earlier, uh, the dance is often viewed as something cute uh, and not very serious. And I think that issue extends beyond the term, but the term certainly reinforces 
those ideas uh, about this dance form. So there are three theories in the dance community as to where this term actually came from in English. Uh, the first one is that it originates from the Arabic word belady, meaning country. And belady has a broad meaning similar to country in English. It can mean the nation, it can mean rural, uh, like country rural areas, and also can refer to country style music, country style dance. The idea here is that belly dance, belly sound the same. So maybe there was kind of like uh, an interpretation, a miss. Uh, communication in English, so that belly transformed into belly dance. Theory number two is that it was coined by a promoter named Solomon Bloom uh, to advertise his Algerian village concession at the World Columbian Exposition or World's Fair of 1893 in Chicago. And as the story goes, he was inspired by the pre-existing French term, danse du ventre, uh, which means literally belly dance. Um, precisely because it sounded scandalous. So creating a scandal was a great way to draw crowds um, into his <laughs> exhibition, to make money at the fair, which was his whole purpose uh, for being there. Um, and in fact, when he, he certainly was invested in this idea of um, pitching the dance as scandalous. However, he doesn't actually take credit in his memoirs, in any of his own uh, writings or interviews for coining the name. And Solomon Bloom took credit for everything else that he may or may not have done. Uh, so it is, it's, it's uh, hard to believe that he would have done something so fundamental for the form and not have um, sort of promoted it as one of his contributions to society. But this hypothesis does get at something interesting, which is that belly dance entered English via French. Uh, if it comes from the French, where did the French get it? So theory number three is that danse du ventre was coined by French colonial forces in North Africa in the 19th century. And maybe the reason that they invented it was because they saw the dancing of uh, cultural groups like the Wella Nail, whose dancing does involve a lot of abdominal movement. And so once they had the term belly dance, they then expanded it to refer to many other dance styles being uh, performed in the region. Now that idea seems to come from a 1993 uh, academic article by the Algerian anthropologist Malik Chabel, uh, but he doesn't give any evidence for it. It's something that he mentions in passing as an idea, but without any evidence. So we know for sure that belly dance existed in English before the turn of the 20th century, um, and so what I did to try to pin down where it started was looking uh, backwards in the primary sources. So things like books, newspapers, and magazine articles that were published at the time to find the earliest references uh, to the term belly dance. And I quickly discovered that belly dance was in use at least five years before the 1893 uh, Chicago World's Fair where Solomon Bloom had his Algerian village concession. So he didn't invent it. Um, it was a direct translation of Danse du Ventre. It entered English as a description of Eastern Mediterranean dance in the wake of the 1889 Exposition Universelle in Paris. So that was another big world's fair. And the format of these world's fairs was generally, uh, there'd be pavilions that were devoted to European technology, fine arts and fashion, and they'd be side to side with living villages where um, you would have natives, and I use that word intentionally in scare quotes for several reasons, um, in traditional costumes who came from parts of the world other than Europe and were supposedly uh, reenacting daily life in their cultural, cultures of origin. These were extremely theatrical and often the people enacting uh, these reconstructions in these uh, villages for entertainment were not from the places that they were representing. Some were, some weren't. Uh, so they were very much fantasy recreations of locations around the world. The most famous of these at the 1889 Exposition Universelle was the Rue du Cahier or Street in Cairo exhibit. And the most popular attraction at the Street in Cairo was the dancers, the Almas. 
Um, so they drew the, the biggest crowds. People were very interested in seeing this dance that was rarely performed in Europe at the time. And in a world connected by telecommunications technology, railways, steamships, uh, the exposition became a worldwide sensation. More than a million foreign visitors attended and it attracted international media attention. So this is when we see the term danse du ventre from French entering languages other from French. Uh, it enters not only English, but also uh, Spanish, Dutch, um, Italian, all sorts of, of other European languages. And in order to explain what it means to uh, their readership, English publications translated danse du ventre into uh, terms like belly dance so the readers could understand what they were talking about. So as an example, the Yorkshire Factory Times, there's an article about the exposition uh, that says, a cafe in the Rue du Cahir attracted 2,000 spectators daily to see the belly dance um, and realized a total of 400,000 francs. So those quotation marks are in the original article as a signal that it's a translation of the French terminology. Now, belly dance was actually not the only way that Dans du Ventre was translated into English around this time. We also get stomach dance, abdominal dance, ventral dance. So it takes a while before belly dance actually becomes the uh, preferred terminology. There are a lot of other translations kind of competing at that time. So this brings us back to Dans du Ventre. If the exposition in Paris made it an, an international uh, phenomenon, uh, was that the first time the French had used it? And the answer is no, they were actually using it uh, decades earlier. It makes its first appearance that I was able to find in the print sources in 1864. Uh, and that's the year that Orientalist artist Jean-Léon Jérôme uh, exhibited his painting La Danse de l'Alme at the Paris Salon. And I'd like to just uh, share this painting so viewers can have a look at it while we're talking and get a sense of it. Now, let's see if I can do it. Okay, and, okay, there we go. All right, so this is Jérôme's La Danse de la May. Uh, you can see it shows a female dancer who's in motion. Um, the men behind her in the audience are soldiers. Um, they're kind of in these slumped postures that are meant to, uh, that, that probably reflect a European idea that laziness and physical exhaustion was an Eastern um, characteristic. And it was associated with kind of immorality and uh, the luxury of the East. Um, she's accompanied by musicians who are playing uh, rebab, violin, darbuka drum, and nay flute. And you can see her torso and her arms are almost completely nude. Um, there, she's only got this little gold vest and some gauzy transparent cloth. And as she leans her upper body backwards, she has her pelvis towards the audience and she's really pushing uh, her abdomen forward. So when this canvas was displayed in 1864, it caused a huge sensation in Paris. And I just want to quote from an article at the time that was a review of the salon. Um, the Egyptian police forbid the dances of the Almes in public. Mr. Jérôme's Lalme performs with impunity before the immense Parisian public, before our mothers, our sons, and our daughters, this danse du ventre, the last word in lechery. Until now, Mr. Jérôme has been content to make women blush. To this success, he has added another. He makes men blush. So this was seen as very shocking, this amount of nudity um, in, and, and sort of prominence of a nude part of the body in a painting. Um, so while it is possible that the term danse du ventre predates this artwork, because it's always possible people were using words and speech before they were published or written down, on the basis of the available evidence, it seems like the term was invented by the French press as an alternative title for the painting. So another review, for instance, says, the painting of Mr. Jérôme, which should have been called, they say, the Danse du Ventre, simply goes by the name Almay. So there are a few comments like that that seem to suggest 
that this became a nickname for the painting specifically because of the prominence of the dancer's abdomen. Um, and there, there's, uh, if we compare this to a real uh, Almé around the same period, I'll just show another photo here, just so you can get a sense. This is from, I say the same period, this is from the uh, Chicago World's Columbian uh, Exposition in 1893. You can see the costuming is similar, but the important difference is she's wearing a blouse that does cover her, um, her midriff area, her uh, belly button, her um, breasts. And so what Jérôme has done in his painting is he has kind of opened this uh, blouse in order to expose those areas that were actually more modestly covered by dancers who were performing in North America and Europe at that time. So what we can see is that it's very unlikely that this name, Danse du Ventre, derived from the cultures of origin, or even that it was inspired by the movements of the dance or the way that real dancers were performing in Europe and North America in the 19th century. Instead, it was based on a fantasy interpretation of Oriental dance by an Orientalist painter. And the name was intentionally disdainful. The press were using it in an intentionally um, critical way in order to emphasize how scandalous that painting was. Uh, so um, in the decades that followed, the term danse du ventre became the common way to refer to a solo female dance from the Middle East, North Africa, Turkey, and Greece. But what I think this uh, origin shows that it, it doesn't actually have um, an organic origin in the cultures of origin for the dance, or even an organic origin in a European or North American's response to actual dancers. But instead it was filtered and mediated uh, through several layers of interpretation from the painter to the media, to the audience of the painting. So when we're thinking about how that term has affected the dance uh, in the long haul, uh, I think it's very worthwhile to see these origins. That's what I wanted to sort of contribute to the, the theme heritage and legacy uh, that we're talking about for the dance today. Ainsley, thank you. Thank you so much for that. And, and you are absolutely correct. You know, when I was putting together the title of this particular event, uh, I didn't want to I didn't want to use the word belly dance. OK, so I analyzed the thing. I was going to use originally just Eastern dance and then the rocks uh, sharky. And then, <laughs> then I said to myself, I said to myself, nobody will know what the hell I'm talking about. So, so uh, did I want to add the fantasy aspect to it? Did I want to be slightly scandalous? Uh, did I want to be subjective or what have you? The answer is absolutely yes. So that, that's why that's why I did the slash, and then I did because nobody would even know what we were talking about with regards well, to. Uh, welcome Easter to the day. problem. Welcome to the problem every professional dancer yeah. has. So I exactly. studied professional dancers, most of whom exactly. use the term belly dance, and yeah. it's because and th this is what people have responded in surveys. It's because people know what that means, and then often when they get students in their classes, then they'll say, "Okay, from now on." we're gonna call what I'm teaching you rock sharky. Now that you're here, that sort of introduces people to the meaning. Yes. No, and no. the big problem we have as well, and other people can speak to this, is we struggle even with a regional term. So a term you'll hear is Minat dance, Middle Eastern, North African, Hellenic and Turkish dance, because it comes from all of these uh, different cultures and regions. And we want to, don't want to be reductive and leave any of them out. Uh, but that's also challenging for communicating quickly to an audience. Maybe we should consider Eastern Mediterranean dance. Honestly, that's not something I've ever thought of before. But that I, I, I think I think that sounds pretty good, actually, because <laughs> because the problem the problem is if you're talking about you know different cultures, you like we said, it may be a Tifta Delhi in one culture. We were we yes. were talking with Heather about different different parts of uh, Egypt and what they call it, etc. So mm -hmm. really, it becomes a very complicated scenario. So, so when I started to analyze this, and I and I saw Eastern dance as a as a you know as a potential, uh, I figured in the end 
that I had to put belly dance. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but but I think the Eastern the Eastern Mediterranean uh, aspect to it, I think that's kind of universal and mm -hmm. there's different forms of the dance within that. Thank you. Thank you again for the uh, for the definition. And thank you for outing me, outing me on putting together this uh, this panel discussion, which which I which by the way I find exciting <laughs> to a certain degree. I love I love what you basically spoke about, and it makes it even more fascinating this discussion. Uh, our, our final panelist, but uh, you know, is um, Panayota Bakis. She's an international uh, performing uh, artist. And a multi uh, multi award uh, winning artist, a fourth generational uh, East, uh, a Middle Eastern Anatolian Greek American, who lives, studies, performs between Greece and the USA, as the director of Hafi, the Hellenic Arab uh, Folklore Institute, she enjoys teaching, performing internationally, and decolonizing dance ethnography. Banayota is the first and only to have codified. And, and structured Sifteddeli, or the, or the so-called you know, Greek belly dance, into a, a detailed dance system. With over 25 plus years in the international Eastern dance belly dancing community, she is best known and respected for her promotion and education of Greek culture. Banayata has spent over two decades sharing the existence of Greek Oriental dance that have flourished both inside of Greece and the diaspora. Um, other recognized contributions include uh, hundreds of Greek belly dancing uh, music translations and for adding the H in M-E-N-A-H-T, which stands, of course, uh, for Alas or uh, Hellenic. Thank you, Panayota, for being with us today. Hi, thank you, Lou, for having me. It's an honor to be here with everybody, uh, fellow dance colleagues. Uh, I get very nervous speaking. I'm much better on stage, but it's okay. I'll do my best. Um, so I just uh, I wanted to add a note for the the term. What we say in uh, in Greece, we don't just say the term tifteteli. We also say um, Anatolitiko horo, which is um, tr literally translates to Eastern dance, Anatolian dance, uh, Greek term Anatolian. And we also say horo tiskilias, which is dance of the belly. And we use Oriental as well, but you'll see in like a lot of dance schools in Greece, in their advertising, they'll say either Oriental, Oriental, or Korotskilias. But when we're doing Tsifteteli, there's like Tsifteteli, the social form, and then we have the Paradosako uh, Tsifteteli, which is folkloric version of Tsifteteli, and then the nightclub versions or whatever <laughs> like this. Um, also, I'm a first generation Greek American, fourth generation as a performing artist, uh, folkloric uh, performing artist. Uh, so I'm going to share with you, I guess, uh, my experience in my life, I guess, uh, briefly, um, that I come from a family of performing artists, um, dancers, musicians, uh, actors as well. Um, it's kind of interesting how belly belly dance came into my life. Uh, I was not expecting to go into this direction and my parents were not thrilled, but it's okay. Um, I grew up a lot watching uh, black and white movies uh, uh, from the Greek and Arabic speaking world. I had a cousin here in Greek town where I grew up and it's Greek, a lot of Arab speakers and Greeks and Armenians. So my, one of my cousins had a big uh, VH, the music, what do you call it, the video, when you used to rent videos, you know, VHS videos. Uh, so we had a lot of international videos and all of this. So I grew up watching all of these uh, these videos and dancing. And we had a lot of, like how you see in the Egyptian film, you see a lot of dance scenes. In the Greek movies also, we had a lot of dance scenes, belly dancing scenes from many years. I mean, we have sometimes like, I know Kira uh, Stavro probably knows as well, uh, even from like when they're depicting uh, like early war movies, we have black and white film with uh, Keti even in it, Keti Butaki, she's, you know, Greek Egyptian. Um, so she's also done films in Greece and in Egypt. So we have big history and connection and love with Egypt and Greece um, together. So uh, I didn't know the term belly dance at all. I've spent my life uh, back and forth in Greece from a young age. And uh, I remember returning back to the States uh, during my high school years and I was 17. And I'm in Radio Shack. I don't know, was Best Buy around back then? Was it still Best Buy or was it Radio, Radio Shack is another company, but I just remember going down the aisles and I see these videos and I said, oh, what is this belly dance? And I just saw, okay, hip scarf, belly's out. This is my thing. Like, what is, what is this? Okay. 
And then I'm like, oh, this is what they call belly dance in the West or in USA. Because I grew up in a very tight bubble. Like the only English interactions, English speaking interaction I would have would be in school. And I was like geeky and dorky and everybody made fun of me. So I barely didn't have many friends in school anyway. So I didn't like interact too much with all the other kids. I was like the hairy, like fat little Greek kid, you know? So, <laughs> so I basically didn't have too much interaction with non-Greek or Arabic speaking people. So I'm like, what, what are these, these things? So there were the belly dance, and I'm sure a lot of you remember the belly dance fitness uh, videos with Rania, Greek belly dancer in California and the belly twins. So I consider them like my first teachers, to be honest, aside from my family members. <clears throat> so I'm like, but I'm like, can I buy this? And they're like, okay, you know, okay, but I'll take it. All right. Little did they know that this would open up a door where I'd go crazy, you know, and I don't think that, you know, looking back, maybe they would have not let me buy this. Uh, so I would just practice at home. Like, you know, I mean, I've known Tiftateli from a young age because we practice and we dance together at family events, functions like this. And in the folk dance um, companies, we do like different sets, but not as like a belly dancer Tiftateli image. Like we just don't really do that, but in, back then, especially, and plus it's different when you're looking at people who are inside of Greece and the Greeks in the diaspora, we're like a much, uh, like a village. Like our families left in the 50s, 60s, 70s, and they come to USA or, Can or Canada, Australia or whatever, and they stay with this mentality. So we're very, very much more traditional and um, maybe archaic minded. I mean, some may, I, mean, I don't know, Gideon, Louis, you guys are more, uh, I know you're more open-minded. I don't know <laughs> how that happened, but um, yeah. So uh, slowly, so I was also teaching, and I've been teaching since I'm 17 years old, Greek folk dance and tiftateli, but not as a staged belly dance version. Okay, so, and when I would see belly dancers also, uh, I didn't know that they were not non-Greeks or Arab speakers, or I didn't imagine that they're like non-Middle Eastern, Eastern people. I just, my mind didn't even make this connection. Uh, sorry, I'm bouncing around a little bit with what I'm saying, but um, uh, so in saying this with uh, not knowing that people, that the dancers were not um, native dancers because in the diaspora, we have our nightclubs uh, that kept the culture and the community together by having, you know, the, the nightclubs and the cabarets and the tavernas and all that where everybody is dancing and performing. But I, I've seen belly dancers, but I didn't know that they're not of one of, you know, from our culture. So I didn't know that this whole community had existed. So then comes the internet uh, and I started searching and I found uh, these two Greek belly dancers, um, my idol and one of my teachers, Kiria, Miss Helena Velako. So I'm sure you all know of her and a dancer, Desvina in uh, Australia. So this is early 2000s, right? So I'm like this Greek kid, really, really, really strict family. I have no like, freedom, no life, no going to the mall and hang out, go down the street to buy something like very strict and like restricted and like closed at the house. So I'm like, okay, I'm emailing these two women. I'm like, oh my God. I said, can you please tell me how did your parents let you belly dance? Are you really belly dancers? Like you're really Greek? Like for real, I don't believe that you're Greek. How are you allowed to do this? Like how, like, please explain to me, what can I do? How can I convince my parents? How can I, I can't even go to take a class. They're so strict. And uh, this was me, I was like 21, 20, 21, and just fascinated that these two women who are Greek and they're like showing their body and they're on the internet and they're dancing everyone. They have this lifestyle and like, they're just doing this amazing things. And I was like crying, like emailing them and they still remember, which is nice. It's like, this is like over 25 years ago. And I still have contact and I study with um, Ms. Helena here and there. And they were just like, oh, you know, whatever they explained to me. I don't remember the exact conversation, but that was just my beginning way and then i started officially taking belly dance classes uh, around their early 2000s although i had the growing up the experience with my own my own cultural style and seeing egyptian dancers from the videos um so i remember going to the class and i didn't even want to my mind was not going to be i'm going to be like a professional belly dancer what like okay I, I would dance at clubs before but not as a how they consider it in the western in our community like the belly dancer uh, and I remember going to one of the teachers, I'm like, I just want to learn some moves for the nightclub because I'm just trying to get married. I don't like, I don't know what is this being like a independent woman. Like I just, you know, can you stop? <laughs> like we go to like Greek clubs, you know, we all go to find a husband, like, especially back then. I mean, in today, maybe not so much like that. But anyways, I was just trying to learn some new dance moves just to impress a guy or something. 
And then eventually it fell into a big, big love affair and I continued um, growing in that. But then my family also, when I wanted to go to classes, they would tell me, what is this? And they would set my aunt to monitor and see who are these American women? Where, what is this? Like, what is this community? So I, I wish I had known prior, like that there was this huge history going back, like you guys had the events and tours and this and that, and just this whole community that I just didn't know existed ever, you know? Uh, so when I first started teaching, uh, I was teaching more in within my community, um, but then when I tried to branch out more uh, to non Greeks, it was very hard for me to get my foot in the door. Uh, because I was advertising going back to the name I was going by Greek belly dance, because that was more my experience and what I had known. Um, so I was struggling a lot to to find my way to get people to listen to me or to to come and back then we didn't have the whole there was my space there was Facebook has was starting around 2006 or four four it was only for students and then it opened up I think in 2006 for non students. Um, so I struggled a lot to to find my place in the in the community in general, and I was very, very blessed and very lucky for Madam Shira you all know I think Shira dot uh, her website Shira dot net. She was so, so nice to me and so loving and welcoming from the beginning, like this, like scared, like 20 year old Greek kid, like, you know, hi, um, like shaking, can I write some articles for you, you know, and she accepted me right away that she had no clue who the hell I was. I had no internet presence. I still don't have a website because my family did not allow me, but now I can't. I just have to get myself together. Now in my 40s, I can do that. But so she had no idea who I am. Like I could be like, who am I, right? So she gave me a chance in my early, I was like maybe 21, when, I think her website, does anybody remember when she had her website up? 20, 2001 or two, or I think 2000. So anyway, somewhere there, she um, she welcomed me with open arms, which was very nice because nobody else was giving me a chance or hearing anything that I had to say. And I started doing um, music translations for her. And that's how it started. And we're still uh, working together and building the proportion of the Greek uh, music uh, translations and articles on uh, Greek culture and dance and all of this. And I feel like that helped me to kind of have my voice be heard because I struggled really hard over like all these years to just get anybody to listen and like, hey, like we're Greeks, like we're part of this as well. <laughs> like it's not just Arabic or Turkish or this, like, hello, there's Armenians too, there's Greeks. So for me, it was a really big struggle. And, uh, you know, it was very hard for me to find my place, but I'm glad that I didn't. I, thanks to Shira that helped me start that way. Um, and so that's when I realized that, that uh, so when I was saying Greek belly dance, for example, I couldn't get people. So I had to keep it with the word belly dance. But as I started getting people, I was explaining, okay, there's this style, there's that style, there's that style. And then I realized that there needed to be like a more codified approach because everybody was getting confused, but at the same time, not understanding that we have the same movement vocabularies as well. Um, and uh, as <clears throat> Mr. Stavros had mentioned, as Greeks, we want to own it and not own it. This is very, very uh, true. And uh, you'll see like in Greece, the direction that the style of the Greek belly dance has gone is because there is a little bit of a disconnect with the Turkish and the history and the conflict that we've had a lot of Greeks more flock towards the Arabic style. So you'll see a lot of the training happening in this this way, but then also go the dancers go back to the Greek style as well in the traditional form. Um, but it's just nice to see how the dance is developing in Greece and with the dancers in Greece and outside of Greece. And I think I'm running out of time. I have a few more things to say, but I can throw that in a little bit later. <laughs> uh, no, say, say whatever you like, brother. Nobody's, nobody's uh, exactly. watching. Yeah, I have a timer because, you know, I'm Greek. I can talk forever. <laughs> so I put a timer to make sure I don't go over time. Okay, so a little bit, not too much. A few more okay. points. Um, so, yeah. Uh, and then um, also had, uh, Heather had mentioned the sexual innuendos um, for for belly dance in Egypt, the same applies for Greece as well. Uh, there's a sexiness and the non sexiness. And then when we social dance together with our boyfriends or husbands or partners or whatever, we have a different way of dancing. And uh, like the Western dancers don't understand that. And I remember when I would teach them like, OK, we dance on bars, we dance on chairs, we dance on tables. It's OK to dance on top of a bar and you have a mini skirt. 
like if you saw the Greek TV shows, <laughs> you like if you saw like I'm like 10 years old watching TV with my parents at Greek TV, and I'm like, why are they doing upskirts in the nightclubs in the Greek nightclubs? Like mini skirts, like up to like really high, high mini skirts. Like and not and not it's not like a strip club, it's like a regular club, like you know, and they're doing upskirts and you know, so there's a lot of like sexiness with the tiftateli, right? And then you have your partner and you literally when you're dancing, you're like like on the other person, you know what I mean? <laughs> so, but in the Western people, when you try to explain that to American dancers, they're like, what? That is so inappropriate. I'm like, no, come to Greek night with me. This is how we're all dancing. What are you talking about? Like, I mean, sorry, Kirill. <laughs> <laughs> not my father, so I kind of like have to be careful to what I'm saying. But hey, uh, listen, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not your father, but I will say, I will, even though, even though we're related, I, yeah, I, right. I will, I will, I will say the following: that that in the past, in the past, your father's generation or what have you, it it was crazier as in, uh, with regards to what we're talking about. In other words, everyone, everyone went to uh, what we called in those days the bouzouki. Okay. Yeah. And and in Manhattan, for example, there must, there must have been like five or six different places, very famous places with very famous dancers, etc. And families would go there and watch uh, the Eastern dance or the belly dance or whatever you want to call it, or the or the Tzifta Delia. And it's true, you know, we all used to dance on tables. Uh, you know, they talk about men dancing the dance. Of course, we dance the dance. I mean, we had we had no problem with it. Uh, as a matter of fact. Um, you know when when uh, when there was a discussion earlier about about men dancing, uh, okay. that goes to the ancient period. That goes to the ancient period. For example, they had the what they call the the cordax, which was was what, an ancient form. It was in the theater. Uh, there would be men dr dressed as women actually, and and dancing. It was scandalous. All the rest of that. So a lot of the things we're talking about have been around for a long time. Let me but before we. We have an open discussion. What's that? What's that figure? What's that figure next to you, behind you, or whatever, with the, ah. with the arm like this? What is that? <laughs> I'm a Chinese medicine TCM student. I'm back in college. <laughs> Makes oh, them really okay. happy because you know I'm a dancer. You know. okay. Continuing my studies properly. <laughs> All right. So, so we're gonna Chinese we're gonna medicine. open up we're gonna open up the discussion right now. If you can, just unmute yourselves and and uh, anything anything that you want to discuss is fine is fine with me. Um, Stavro, uh, uh, unmute yourself. So we, we've had a discussion. This has been a fascinating, a fascinating one. Uh, so, anyone have any questions of any of any one of the um, panelists in terms of their presentations? Uh, please uh, don't hesitate to ask it. It's it's us just getting together in the living room discussing discussing the Eastern dance. So please. Well, I. Oh. Yeah, please go ahead. Ainsley, please. Oh, sure. Please, uh, well, Ainsley. actually, my, my question draws on something you said, uh, Stavros, about the dance creating a new relationship with your body and the way that you had experienced it. And I thought that was such a worthwhile point. And I wanted to throw that out to everyone. Maybe you would speak to it further. But if, if other panelists would like to speak to your experience of taking up the dance, whether that's learning it uh, in childhood or... Um, as an older person and how that influenced your relationship with your own body. I think, uh, first of all, I want to say something about the how, how Louis got all of us together. Um, and we all prepared very different things. Well, I didn't prepare anything, but, but obviously uh, people prepared uh, very, very well. And, and I think that that's just great in the sense that it's shown, it's revealed rather, not just shown, it's revealed uh, the, the 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 great variety of approaches mm -hmm. and and all the different angles and perspectives that we all have and enjoy and we like to take and we like to pursue in terms of our engagement with the traditions of this art form. So I think it's worked out very well, Louis. The fact that there is such awesome. enormous variety in the approaches of the panel tonight, this evening. Well, it's evening for me. Yes, anyway. yes. Thank, thank you so much. But 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 uh, respond respond to the question uh, that, that was posed by Ainsley. But the, yes, the relationship yes. with the body. Well, first of all, I think that these it, it, it's true of all dance. To be fair, it's just that because we love Oriental dance, belly dancing, dance, event, or whatever we want to call it, whatever we can call it, 
we are we are uh, we have a certain a sense of um, a sense of closeness in terms of uh, in terms of that particular adoration. Um, but certainly, like I said earlier, when when you know we inhabit our bodies and we perform our personalities in our daily lives, mm -hmm. and when it comes to performing in a certain with a certain dance vocabulary, especially if you love the music and you and it speaks mm -hmm. to you. Um, then certainly every time you're revising in the sense of re-looking at that, Ainsley, I'm inspired by your um, attention to etymology because revise, doesn't it mean to see, to look at something again? Revise. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, so we, we tend to look at our bodies in a different context. And I think it, it, it also trains the imagination to other ourselves, which is extremely important. It's similar to reading because reading trains the imagination um, to other the self. And that's how we become conscious of the world around us and of our existence in the world at the same time. So it's the same with dance, except that it makes you a lot more self-conscious because you know you're 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 actually asked to set that body in motion, to combine movement and to, you know, show in front of other people and, and make yourself, you know, much more vulnerable, which also makes you paradoxically stronger. <laughs> Have I answered the question, Luis? I could go on. I, I, no, 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 I, no, listen, I, I enjoyed it. You know, myself, myself, um, I never had a problem with, with, with dancing. Uh, we, we always danced with the family, etc. Whenever we went out, my, my sisters were excellent, excellent dancers, by the way, and and no one had a problem in the family if they dance, if they dance, the way people may think is sensual or what have you, because it was with family. And when I say family, I mean even if we went to an event where there were other people there, and even though they weren't blood related, they were all family. So there was nothing. There was nothing really in our culture. There was there was that sexual aspect of it. And everyone was able to to express, you know, their their you know their emotions and rhythms and body or what have you. I would love to dance that type of dance. Uh, to tell you the truth, actually, it you know with with our, with our culture also in mainland Greece because because we were we were to a, to a certain degree uh, at some point in time, you know, sort of the Eastern aspect of it disappeared from. From, from the culture until, like we said, the 1920s, when there was an exchange of the population. And when you had, obviously, uh, 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 the music styles of the East, you know, uh, you know, came into mainland Greece, it became very popular, what have you. But, but you know, when, when, I was, when I was raised, it was, it was beyond that period. In other words, it was part of the culture. So mm -hmm. it, was, uh, it was a very good thing. When I went to the, the first time I went to an actual, where professionals danced, uh, I have to tell you, it was very impressive. It was very interesting, and you learn. You you know, many times when I when I when I would go to dances, I'd sit there and just watch, especially very good dancers, to get to get tips tips on how to dance. Um, uh, uh, Tamalin, would you like to talk about what what the discussion is and the question of Ainsley? Okay, um, I stepped out for a minute, and I came Ainsley, back. just repeat the question if you can. Yeah, it was just going back to what Stavros had said about the dance changing your relationship with your body. Okay, that I definitely can. I mean, you know, he went very deep, but I can tell you, you know, in okay, in American culture of of my time period, um, there was a very strict way that you were supposed to look, you were supposed to be thin, you proportional, you know, um, there was so much pressure on young women as, as far as their appearance went. And so we were always dieting from the time we were maybe in sixth grade. Our mothers dieted and they would teach us to diet. And mm -hmm. I had anorexia as when I was 11, 11 to 12 and then thir no and 14 to 15 and um so I know how to diet but it and then I gained weight after I went to Mexico as an exchange student I gained weight um 
and started eating too much because I had that perspective of another cult culture that didn't didn't think you have to be skinny. And it wasn't, nothing got resolved until I started doing belly dance. And then it was incredible. I could love my body. And it sounds like so simple, simplistic, but it made all the difference in the world. I probably would have been bouncing back and forth like a yo-yo dieting and and eating again, if it hadn't been for this dance. I, I will say one thing when we talk about weight, because I think this is an important discussion, quite frankly. And I think Heather Heather was was uh, also showed some of the clips to see the differential. Weight, the way we looked at it in the East, I think in the past was was radically different. In other words, in other words, what was beautiful was someone who was heavier, because it indicated that that person had food to eat. This may sound crazy. Mm -hmm. But a, but a thin person, a thin person didn't make it culturally. It, it had to be a person that was a little bit, a little bit, uh, you know, heftier beca because of this aspect of, of wealth and all the rest of that. And in terms of dancing, in terms of dancing, I think, I think that you need, uh, I, I hate to use these terminologies, but I'll use them anyway, because it doesn't matter. Uh, you, you need more meat on the bone, I think, in terms of, in terms of, of belly dancing. I could be wrong, but this is the way I look at it. Actually... Because I've been around and I am around many different cultures and dance styles that are not necessarily Middle Eastern. Well, um, I have different perspectives and I still like to, you know, not get not gain weight or to lose weight sometimes. And so one day I was with a friend of mine who had a Somali cafe and she was Somali and we used to watch these Somali dance videos. They were pretty amazing. Nobody was skinny and none of the dancers. There were skinny Somali women, but not the dancers. And one day I'm, I was in her cafe and, you know, she was making up the chapatis and the rice and all this stuff. And I'm like, oh, I can't have this. I can't have that right now. I'm trying to lose weight. And she looks at me and she's like, if you lose weight, how are you going to dance? <laughs> and it was so diametrically opposite of the Western, especially the American pers perspective. Heather, your thoughts, I'm sorry, Heather, your thoughts on, on uh, Ainsley's yeah, question? I, look, I, um, I, I always try to, okay, first I'll say that culturally speaking, uh, the preferred body type in Egypt right now really depends on the social class of the consumer and what the elites want to see in their nightclubs is much different than what somebody wants to see in Kenya in Upper Egypt. Um, so there's that aspect of it. It's not monolithic in the culture, but I, I try to be really cautious about statements about a correct body type to belly dance because um, while of course we've had a lot of pressure, especially on women uh, to be slender, to be slim in Western cultures, it's very risky to go the other way. Yeah. And for slender men and women to feel like they're somehow abnormal and not fit to do this. So I don't feel there's any appropriate body type for this. The body is the body you're in. And while unfortunately every culture has its vision of the ideal, but when you look at um, the famous dancers in Egypt through the ages, or even locally popular dancers, there is a broad range, you know? So yeah, Egypt definitely veers towards a more voluptuous ideal but i think just in terms of uh our outreach to new learners i don't like to present that there's any ideal type mm -hmm. that that can do this yeah angela you want to answer your own question or what? <laughs> yeah and i i agree with heather com completely about anyone can do this dance and there is cultures have different aesthetics but in terms of i've had when i was teaching students, you know, men, women, non-binary people, 
all body types, disabled people, all ages. So anyone can do the dance. But I do think in terms of this dance did change my relationship with my body. I first was exposed to it when I was lucky to be at a United World College. My roommate was Egyptian. And for her uh, National Day performance, she did a belly dance, she choreographed a group of students um, in a belly dance number. And I had grown up in Newfoundland without a heritage dance form. So I grew up, I did a little ballet class, but I didn't grow up dancing uh, the way that people do in many cultures. And particularly when I saw this dance on the stage, I looked at it and I thought, and it was at mixed group men and women, uh, young men and women, and I thought, I've never seen the human body move like this before. <laughs> and I was so blown away by it that I wanted to start doing it right away. That's what really wowed me. And I had been a young person, a teenager, and Paniota, you re referenced being a nerd. Uh, so I kind of viewed myself like, you know, brain in a vat. Like, I'm a student, I'm, you know, I'm an intellect, I don't understand. Everything. With a massive unibrow as well. <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, we all have our crosses to bear. <laughs> but, you know, not no relationship to anything below the neck. And when I started this dance form, um, and you can get this experience of increased embodiment with any dance or with sport, people experience it in different ways. But for me, particularly moving my torso um, was very, enabled me to craft such a stronger relationship with my body, particularly as a woman, and moving parts of my body that were normally um, objectified in a way to express myself. So now, even though if I perform, people are looking at me, instead of being a static image, I'm saying something back. I'm using my body to express something back. And for me, that was uh, completely changed my relationship with my own body and made me confident enough later in life to do more physical things um, that I would never have otherwise considered doing, like modeling, like I've performed a couple of short films. Those are things I would never have considered doing had I not built a foundation of stronger embodiment. And Pana Yoda, I would love to hear your response too. Oh, okay. Uh, so unfortunately I, I did experience uh, eating disorders growing up and to this day kind of, um, but uh, being, uh, uh, you know, bullied as a kid and then coming more into my own and realizing like, okay, well, look at you, how you bullies look like now, look at me now, okay? <laughs> like, I feel like the belly dancing really transformed me, but more on the, much more than just the body level, um, more also like mentally and how I think and how just, because as I mentioned before, I, I grew up in a very, very tight bubble. I had no experience of what other American girls were doing. So coming into this whole belly dance world with other American women, I'm like, what? And like I would tell them stories or things that I'm going through or just my life in general, they kind of like took me, a lot of them took me under their wing and really opened up a whole other world for me mentally, like, um, have to be more modern minded and what to accept and not to accept. So more than just a mind body, like a more, not just like a body, like a whole mind body spirit, like a whole thing together for me, the dancing um, helped in that. But, uh, and also unfortunately, like, as you know, we change, we, we, we grow, you know, every few years we're growing, decades are passing. I feel like each uh, change is bringing different uh, struggles and good things for us because there are people think eating disorder is only with ballet but eating disorders and things like this uh, exist in the folk dance world and the belly dance world and unfortunately i collapsed this summer because i was extremely underweight now i've gained weight <laughs> so um it's it's a struggle that um in and folk dance world and belly dance world because with the folk dancing world in greece that they have this ideal of like really thin i don't know why um, and so I kind of got sucked into that ha going back to Greece more year, the, the more the recent, the past few years I've been living in Greece more now. And uh, I kind of got sucked into it and I'm like, oh my God, I, get, I gotta get thinner and thinner and thinner <laughs> to the point where I literally lost consciousness. Um, and then to be in folk dance companies, they want very slim body um, because it's also the costumes, the more layers, layers, you get bulkier and just for some reason, you know, it's like this. And then you have Lebanon, they prefer slimmer bodies. And if you're dancing, in a club and I made a note that I wanted to say that 
you know, as a teacher too, I feel like I personally struggle, like how when you're teaching students, like we, we, we have to be realistic, but how do we go about it in a nice way? Because, okay, within our communities, we are, we're all embracing our bodies. Cause at one point I had gained like over a hundred pounds. I was like 260 pounds and I, I got to love all of myself. Right. But realistically, was I getting work? In Egypt, yeah, I have a lot of fans in Egypt, like, you know, but um, like other countries, like here in the Northeast in USA, uh, they prefer like the Lebanese, we have a big Lebanese community here, they want slimmer bodies, like very slim body style. But unfortunately, it's like when we're talking, we have to be clear, who, what are we speaking about? Our community, like uh, amongst each other, or being working professional dancers? There's difference there. So I don't know if I answered the question, that's it. Yeah, the the company you were referring to was that the Dora Stratu? Or... Yeah, I was. I, I'm in different companies, not just there. But I was there a few years ago. That I I danced the summer season, uh, the Anatolian suite of uh, the National State Com Dance Company of Greece, folkloric dance. Uh, Heather, I think you were you wanted to say something. Uh, I I yeah. do I do because both Ainsley and Peniota, things you're saying are really resonating with me. Because first of all. I, Ainsley, I never really answered your question, but I, you know, the whole idea of finding existing in your body was really what this did for me. <laughs> and, um, you know, and I, I wanted to mention that as a lady of a certain age, as I'm, I'm perimenopausal, having that embodiment understanding my body is I'm finding saving my life right now <laughs> in this process. So, but that's all I'll say about that. But about uh, the last point, uh, Paniata, you said about realism and boy, oh boy, as an instructor, this is really a challenge when you have students who want to go to the professional level with belly dance because I don't have, it's not that common, but when they do, you have to have that hard conversation about the market and the realities of the market. And the market is not like our community. <laughs> the market is vicious. Uh, no matter where it is. I mean, in the market in Egypt, for example, a lot of dancers who study in the West want to go to Cairo and make their name. And the reality, if they're going to dance in high-end nightclubs, is there's high pressure for plastic surgery, for augmentation. BBLs. <laughs> a lot of things, you know, uh, for skin lightening, for you, you name it. And the, the professional side of this industry is ugly in a lot of ways. Um, so it's a hard conversation to have to have when, as a teacher, you start them on the diet of, this is for everyone and all bodies. And then when they wanna go to that level, yeah, it's, it's kind of not. It's kind of not. Um, let me, let me, yeah, please go ahead, please. I I wanted to. Um, I mean this 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 discussion is obviously so important to all of us, um, and there is also the other dimension uh, of uh, Tamalin's visits to all these different countries and bringing her experience of all the different cultures and, and emphasizing how it, the, the, the sociality of the dance. Um, and then Ainsley uh, demonstrating Saeed's argument in Orientalism in such a wonderful way and, and bringing it to the fore gets once again. I thought that was fascinating. And I, I love Panayotas's personal narrative and that also resonated with me paradoxically in, in some very interesting ways. I think our stories are very human and, and to be shared. And then Heather, you made so many interesting comments about uh, the dance at the beginning of the 20th century. And I wanted to ask you, you talked a little bit about how the common narrative is that the dance in the 20th century developed out of contact 
with the West and how it fashioned itself according to Western taste. And you made the very interesting comment that that may not have been quite the case. You talked a little bit about nationalism and dance vocabulary, uh, the amalgamation of different moves, the deliberate hybridization, I think is how you put it. Um, and you you said that the posters were in Arabic, so the, uh, English soldiers could not read them, for example. Um, and I thought, I thought that was you know that was a revelation for me. I did I hadn't thought about that. I didn't know about that, and I loved hearing about it. Tell me, what about the the commercialism of the dance? Because dancers have performed for money, and and that's perfectly legitimate. This is what you do. It's your profession. Um, Karen Van Newkirk's uh, work is seminal and still quoted 28, almost 30 years after it was published. So didn't they want to be commercial? Didn't they want to be successful? Um, why wouldn't they cater to the British taste, let's say, to put it crudely, almost? Of course they wanted to make money. I mean, I, I think that's undeniable. And I think though we underestimate uh, the local consumer base. You know, nice. this was yeah. a really vibrant entertainment scene that existed in Cairo at that time. And, uh, you know, foreigners were really a minority of the consumers who were patronizing these venues. So. Um, I think, though, that uh, when you look at uh, advertising from the time, there are there were venues that catered primarily to foreigners. There were venues that tried to cover all their bases. There were venues that were more exclusively oriented towards a native clientele. And I think that um, much as in the present day, that foreign clientele made their way into venues that were catering to an indigenous clientele because of the exoticness of it, the, the foreignness of it, of these women moving in this scandalous way, you know. Um, but I, I really think it's important to give agency back to the Egyptian population in the transformations that were happening in the dance at that time, because, um, you know, we're very focused obviously on dance, but when we look at what was happening musically at the time, and in terms of uh, the Arabic theater, there was a massive consumer base. So they didn't need to depend on foreigners to get rich. They got rich from Egyptian consumers and which is exactly what happened with the Egyptian cinema as well. You know, the cinema was in no way intended to capture a foreign clientele. The consumers of the early Egyptian cinema were Egyptian. So I, I agree uh, for sure, they're going to follow the market where it leads, but the market was indigenous. Yeah, and they were also fashioning it at the same time. That's fascinating, Heather. Thank you. Thank I, I, I think you. what was said is correct, that in fact, the, the indigenous people of all cultures are, are really the market. But speaking to the market for a second, and going back to the concept of legacy and heritage, to a certain degree, we've been talking about, about heritage, okay, uh, of the different cultures. But let's talk about really where, where things are going in terms of, in, and also in terms of the market. We talked about the distinctive features um, of this particular Eastern dance is the emphasis on the controlled movement of certain body parts, uh, hips, torso, etc. But now there are other cultures and other movements coming into it, which are going way beyond anything that was part of the tradition. When you see some of the, um, you know, again, I don't want to talk cultural, but when you see some of the Ukrainian dances, some of the Russian dances, etc., there's, there's forms now that are going way beyond, way beyond anything I think that was ever contemplated in terms of the traditional aspects. What, what are your, as dancers, as performers, as writers about this topic, uh, what are your thoughts about where, where it's going, at least in, in that trend? And again, if we can, uh, we can start, uh, we can start with Stavro and we'll just go one by one. I'm just curious what your thoughts are about this. 
My goodness, I couldn't answer that. I want to hear from from the people who are on the field. Oh, okay, okay. Than, how about yeah. how about Tamala? Tamala. Yeah. Um. Well, okay. I think everybody has their art to share the way that they can share it or with what they know, but um, be you know, sometimes we lose the simplicity and the beauty of what actually is traditional. And I don't mean to keep it like a museum and always exactly the same traditions, but especially like, let's say in the United States with, with fusing with a lot of things, um, then sometimes the original gets forgotten. Like, when I teach, I teach with, you know, people have to know about the tact instruments, the oud, ne, kanun, kamanja, violin, and the rick. Like they have to know about those instruments and how to respond to them and and um, the tact seams and so forth. I If they don't know basic movement, basic understanding of the origin music, how are they just going to go and mix in everything else from the latest top 40 American music? Um, to me, that is really sad. Um, when I came to Louisiana, I taught classes, you know, trying to teach about that. And there were people that had been dancing like 10 years that had never danced to a Middle Eastern song. But, you know, and I'm like, if it, I think innovations, if you have your, your base that's very, very strong and you want to add something else in there, you can innovate, but then the next person that learns from you, they can get confused and think that innovation is the base. So when you innovate, then if you teach or sometimes you're not teaching, you're getting copied, but we need to find a way to stop people from being confused about what it is, because I, I, I've seen the craziest stuff, you know, people can believe me when you get in some of the hinterlands of America, I mean, you've got people dancing in deer antlers. <laughs> you've got like, oh, deer, deer antlers. I, I am not <laughs> kidding. You have people announcing this as, as being Spanish. Yeah. You have, like, there's so but, much confusion. I'm, no, it, there, there is there is confusion. Heather, your thoughts, because because a lot of these foreign dancers are actually coming into the Middle East, actually, and, and, and dancing with styles that have nothing to do, Heather, with, with any, mm -hmm. any any traditional traditional dances. They have the, the, they move their body parts in certain directions, but it's a completely different scenario. What are your thoughts on that? <laughs> I, I, can, I have a deep relationship to what Tamalyn just said about the hinterlands because boy I've seen things too <laughs> I've seen it all and yeah it's uh it's saddening you know how in western cultures but especially in the U.S. um there's been a tendency to detach movement from any kind of aesthetic and musical framework that's based in the cultures of origin. Um, since the pandemic, I've done a lot more online uh, teaching and networking, and I'm finding that's less the case in some international belly dance communities, but in the U.S. it's certainly an endemic issue. But but the, the flip side of the coin is um, we have to be careful not to treat the dance in the culture of origin as static or frozen in aspect. And I'll, I, it's always in flux. And I'll give an, a really interesting example, maybe interesting to the nerd in me, but um, I just came back from my last research trip in Egypt and one of the interviews slash classes I experienced was with uh, one of the traditional dancers that I showed you. Her name is Um Hashem. And the style she practices is the Upper Egyptian Gawazi style, which is the rural professional belly dance 
uh, but specific to Upper Egypt, her version of this. And it's typically very flat footed, heavy, percussive steps, and uh, not the kind of languid, gooey core work that we associate with urban Cairo. But I'd seen her multiple times do two movements that were very Cairo. Um, she did something on the balls of her feet, which I'd never seen traditional Gawazi in that region do. And she did a certain core movement that I never saw anyone do. And so I, I wanted to penetrate into that. And, and she told me, well, uh, I, I asked her, what, what about those movements? And she said, oh, that's Sharki, Rak Sharki, meaning it's urban Cairo. It's not her style. And I said, oh, but, but you're doing Rak Shabi. Shabi means folk dance, which is how they refer to their style of belly dance. And, and I said, but Shabi, I showed her, you know, flat footed. And she said, yeah, of course. And I said, but you did those two things. And she said, well, yeah, but I like those things. <laughs> and she said, this is my style. Yeah. So for her, it was important to personalize her style of the local traditional dance. And she didn't see it as inauthentic. And certainly her local audiences don't see her as inauthentic. And I thought as I was in this interview, this is how change happens in traditional mm -hmm. dances. Yeah, but so, but more than that, more than more than that, you know, you know what I think, uh, Heather, that every dancer, every dancer, regardless of traditional dance, every dancer has their particular style. Exactly. And, and no one, no one has, no one has a problem with that at all, because they understand that it's tradition, but that's their particular uh, style. Ah, uh, ah, uh, exactly. Yeah. And she's mm -hmm. innovating within an aesthetic framework that she understands. She knows how far she can push it until it's inauthentic because it's her tradition, you know? And that's why foreigners have to educate themselves about those aesthetics within the cultures of origin because like a dance colleague of mine said this really well, you can take the same batter and make a pancake or make a waffle, but it's the same batter, okay? You need to start with the same batter, right? Yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. Ainsley, I know you weren't dancing the way they were talking with those antlers behind you, but, but give, us, give us your thoughts on, yeah. on, uh, <laughs> on, on where, where the dance is going, not necessarily from the traditionalists, but, but completely, completely different scenario, having nothing to do with the traditionalists. Yeah, I think you're you're hitting on something <clears throat> that the dance community has had so much discussion about, particularly over the last decade. Um, and what's bound to happen when you're talking about cultural styles that become globalized, so rooted in, in cultures, they globalize, now they're practiced all over the world. It's inevitable that then they become relocalized in the new areas um, where they've been transported. So any aspect of culture that moves uh, to another place will relocalize in that place. And so what happens is the community of dancers in the new region, um, uh, it's not even necessarily a hybridization with uh, dances that already exist there, but aesthetic values that exist within that cultural community um, or past physical experiences, common types of uh, physical activities will inevitably influence uh, the way the dance is practiced in that space. So you get things like what we call, you know, American Oriental style, Ukrainian Oriental style. You can see differences in dancers who have come up in different regions in terms of uh, the way their movements, uh, the way their musical interpretation um, varies from dancers from the cultures of origin. Uh, the, the problem that the dance community has kind of been grappling with, I think it's, it's a reckoning in a way, uh, is that so many of the teachers and leaders in the dance community outside of uh, the Minat region are not uh, connected with Minat culture traditionally. So it's not their own um, family heritage. Uh, and they are, as Heather alluded to, not necessarily connected with the culture outside of dance practice. And the question that has come up within the dance community is, um, is it 
reasonable, is it fair, is it appropriate um, for cultural outsiders to be leading the development of cultural dance styles um, outside those cultures of origin? So there's the, the, the discussion that's happening in many fields about cultural appropriation is happening within the belly dance, oriental dance uh, communities too. And I will say that for myself, um, I still do dance research and I dance for fun, but I had to take a break from teaching and performance uh, for health reasons. And I didn't really get back into it after. And part of the reason I didn't was because these issues of cultural appropriation weighed very heavily on me. And my idea of my what is my place as a dancer in the community? What is reasonable for me to do? What are my um, ethical responsibilities for teaching students? Um, are, are things that gave me pause and caused me to kind of step back for the time being and let I want to let other people take the lead. So I think when you're talking about where do we see the dance uh, going in the future, as the community contracts, because Tamlin referred to the fact that there was a boom in the 70s and a contraction and a boom in the early 2000s and a contraction now exacerbated by COVID, what you're seeing is many of the very serious, very prolific dancers who remain standing are people who are from the cultures of origin or very, very deeply uh, researched and versed and embedded within the cultures of origin if they come from outside it. So I think that moving forward, the, the kind of type of innovation that Heather's talking about, innovating within tradition, will perhaps take a stronger role in North America and Europe than it necessarily has in the past. Panayata, I know you. I know you have thoughts on this particular issue. Uh, do you want to just unmute yourself for a second? <laughs> I have thoughts on many things, but okay. Um, okay, so I took some notes. Uh, so it depends on what we're talking about, right? If we're talking about the Eastern, the Russian, uh, Romanian, Bulgarian dancers, or um, in the States, um, I will say for for USA. Um, I personally don't agree with the term. Uh, American cabaret, American Oriental. Uh, and I have written uh, many posts about this in the past. I know many have told me, put this in articles, do this or that, but I haven't gotten around to it yet, but it's all in my profile. If anybody wants to see my opinions on this, I'm very vocal in the past. <laughs> but um, in my opinion, uh, there's nothing American about American cabaret um, because this was developed amongst the native dancers and the musicians, because the musicians are the ones that made this structure and made this flow of energy and sounds and the rhythms put together and the dancers were there as well because and i've written about this as, as well because back in the day the greek men the middle eastern men turkish men uh, armenian men they're very old school very strict very like macho they're not going to take orders from any dancer especially a dancer tell, telling him you're going to do in this and this and this no they're going to play their music the way that they want and they're going to help us have the structure. And another thing why I don't consider American, because from my research and seeing uh, and having interaction with many other Greeks and Greek communities in the diaspora, not just USA, in Canada, Australia, in South American countries, if you see some of the dancers from back then, it's like the same musical style, right? Because also these musicians, they don't just stay in USA. Even to now, now today, if you follow our artists, whether they're Arab speakers or Turks or Greeks or Armenians, they're traveling all over the world. We have USA tour, all the musicians coming and the bands that go together, they go to Canada, they go to the South, Australia, everywhere, you know, so I don't consider that flow. And even with the veil wrapping, the 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 flow that we have, you come out wrapped or you understand how the style of the American cabaret is. OK, uh, it's not just like that in USA. It's in all these clubs where the Greek bands are together, like there's literal foot, there's literally footage. So you, what are they going to say? This is Australian cabaret. This is Canadian cabaret. No, it's I personally and I discussed with this uh, with uh, Miss Lee Ali. She's one of the ones she's the one that started the movement for the me not change of the, the to have the word me not put together. And I just added the H in there. So we were discussing and she's in the process of writing a book uh, about this. Uh, about her experience and her opinions on this. Um, so I, I had said I'm going with the word Anatolian cabaret or Anatolian um, Anatolian American cabaret because that keeps that includes the other people as well, like the Turks, the Armenians, Jewish, uh, Roma as well. Um, so for me, American cabaret doesn't exist, in my opinion, right, as a term. 
Um, and in the States, in terms of how, where the dance is going with how you had mentioned the, the boom every few decades, right? I feel like now we're seeing, especially with the diaspora and more Western country, um, we're seeing more native dancers uh, being more comfortable and free to come out, <laughs> as we say, right? Like come out in the sense like, okay, now like I'm in my early forties, I feel more comfortable. Like my parents are not gonna probably kill me and beat the shit out of me. I mean, it's uh, I've been threatened in the past. I'm laughing, yes, it is, it's funny and it's sad, but I have been threatened that I'll be like pulled out by my hair if my baba found out if I'm anywhere. So I have to be careful. But I'm saying like, I've noticed personally seeing other dancers of the culture who are more comfortable and confident coming out who are first generation in they're like older, like in their late thirties or in their mid, mid late thirties, early forties, and they're more comfortable coming out. So you see more of us in different states, like, and in Canada, and I see other Greek girls too, who are first generation. When you're talking about native dancers who are maybe second generation, third generation, or their parents are half American or half white or half something, and they didn't grow up in a strict bubble, they have more freedom and they're more out and about. So having, so seeing now more of native dancers coming onto the scene more and giving, uh, given a space and being heard, because before our, our voices were not really heard. Like I'm telling you, I'm in Boston, over 25 years and at the beginning i'm like hello nobody wanted to hear what i was gonna say you know because they got so they got so used to the western uh approach of teaching and speaking and all and all of this right and if i'm making sense and then just to make a comment about um the eastern european dancers the other eastern european dancers the thing is okay they are a little extreme at some times but at the same time i mean i don't like everything that they're doing but also we have to respect and see that they are they do a lot of hard work a lot of them you know they are dedicated and hardworking dancers and it's not easy what they're doing but um in terms of the music and how the dance is moving as well the music the egyptian music is getting faster has been faster so movement is faster technique is more complicated and it's also competitive dance so everybody unfortunately they have to add extra things to bring more to their stage right or if you take for example iraqi dance you'll see how like they're they look like they're having a seizure which is not traditional style of doing an Iraqi style show or head movements, for example, they're doing it, they're going too much, you know, but every dancer has their way, I guess. And, uh, and one last thing about the Eastern Europeans, I have to say, sorry, one last thing. Uh, a lot of these dancers are many dancers who are not just like uh, Eastern European, they're actually, they're Armenian or they have Greek heritage, like Sofinar, who is a friend of mine and one of my teachers who I love and respect so much. And she's in Egypt, like a big star there. She's Armenian, which in Russia, but she's Armenian. So a lot of these girls that grow up with, and there's other, I forget her name, um, Alavat, I think she's also Armenian. Alavat, yeah. Yeah, and there are other girls too, that they're, you know, they're from the culture, but people don't know, they don't discuss this um, about them. And as well, also the dance competition scene has changed this. So they're growing up in this dance competition mentality of more, 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 more do more to show more to potentially win. So they leave with this way of thinking. And then hopefully they go to Egypt and calm down maybe <laughs> in their ways. But uh, that's it. I don't know if I answered Okay, it. we're, we're going to wrap it up. But what I'd like is uh, one by one, just give your final thoughts on uh, anything you like uh, with regards to the discussion or further discussions. Uh, we'll start with Stavio. Stavio? Thank you. Uh, I've enjoyed myself immensely. I've learned a great deal. Um, uh, and uh, I, I'm, I'm quite grateful and that, that I've been part of this. Perhaps uh, in the last part of the discussion, uh, I don't know if it's my age, but I am, in other words, I'm, I think I'm the oldest in the, on the panel. I am very relaxed uh, about uh, questions of, um, of course, it's a difficult topic, appropriation and so on, and I've written about it, I've published on it, but more and more I'm relaxing about it because I, it, it, it's art and it depends on who serves it and for what purposes and so on. And anyone can, ser can serve it irrespective of ethnic origin and, and so on. I love, for example, when I hear about Dutch people who love Rembetica. And they know more about Marie Canino and Soderia Bello than I do. <laughs> and it's great. It's great. I, I love it. And so yeah, I've, I've studied belly dancing. I talk with Egyptian people and some of them are indifferent to it. Some of them know a lot more. But, you know, it's, I repeat, it's art. It's there to be served, enjoy, serviced, maybe. 
of a verb anyway. I don't know. But it's, it's there to be enjoyed, to be learned, to be, to be passed on. And it's giving. <laughs> you just have to give to it. So, Thank, thank you, Stavla. Tamalin? Well, um, okay. One thing I'd like to add is, you know, we have the term menat, which we talked about today, um, Middle Eastern, North African, Hellenic, and Turkic. Um, and that is a very positive development. The only thing I've noticed is sometimes there are people that have not are not doing a dance that anybody of any of these cultures would recognize or, or identify with. And yeah. then they call themselves not dancers, feeling that that would be more legitimate than using the term belly dance. But then it's not because it's like, we if we're gonna use a word, it becomes pretentious if mm -hmm. we're using it to to think that you know we're doing something of something better than belly dancing or a better way of describing it and then we go back and we you know just do something you know very i'm not going to say basic but you know with not without much background behind it so i think we have to be careful of not overstepping like our descriptions of ourselves, either. Mm -hmm. yeah. Heather, Heather, your uh, final thoughts, uh, comments? Sure. And first, uh, Lou, thanks so much for organizing this and inviting me. And thanks to all oh, the thank you. for all of this great discussion. I mean, it was so insightful. And I, I mean, um, I think this will be a, an important watch for a lot of dance students out there. I'm going to keep, I've shared the link already, but I'll keep sharing it because I think these are important conversations that <laughs> students of the dance should listen to. Um, I think that my, I, my closing message in all of this would be um, let's continue to penetrate into cultures of origin and listen to diverse voices within those cultures, speaking from towards the Egyptian case um, in the quote belly dance industry, there's a tendency for us only to pay attention to the most visible dancers and the loudest voices. Um, there are certain people who dominate the teaching circuit. And unfortunately, the voices of uh, traditional entertainers, as well as regular people gets lost in the shuffle. So I'd like to redirect all our attention towards that because it's the culture that wraps around the dance that really helps us to understand the dance itself. Thank, thank you so much. Uh, um, Ainsley, you're Thoughts, comments? Yeah, this has been a fabulous conversation. And I was struck by sadness when you said we were wrapping up because I could keep talking <laughs> with this group all night. Uh, so maybe at some point we can all get together again over yes. coffee again. <laughs> um, but I think my parting thought is uh, so we, we talked about our predictions for where the dance is going and something rather than a prediction, perhaps a wish that I would like uh, for the future of the dance is to see less focus on performance and more focus on social dance. Because outside the cultures of origin, the fact is there aren't many opportunities necessarily for people who aren't in the cultures of origin to do this as a social dance. And the result is that the only opportunity people feel they have to enjoy it is to take lessons and then perform it. And unfortunately, that is that, I mean, it's not realistic to have that many performance opportunities for so many people, but also it creates a type of pressure on the dancer that's different from just enjoying the dance in a social context. So I, I would love to see more emphasis, more opportunity for dancers to just enjoy the dance socially, which is in many ways the way I think it's meant to be enjoyed and has been enjoyed for centuries. Thank, thank you so much, Angela. Panayata, your thoughts, comments? 
Uh, first, I want to thank you uh, for organizing this and everybody else that is here. It was an honor and pleasure to be here with everybody and discussing. Uh, can you please pronounce your name, Ains Ainsley? Oh, Ainsley. Ainsley. Okay. So I'm going to close with this, uh, with the social dancing and where to go and what to do. Um, and the question is, where is the dance going, right? Or what is it where we're closing? Opinion. No, no, whatever comments you have, thought uh, yeah, okay. whatever we discussed. Yeah, so um, I wanted to end with um, being also more like a Greek uh, organized uh, event um, in terms of body inclusivity and performance. As we mentioned, we discussed before about different body types and not being able to work at certain places. What I have seen and I like to share, uh, I've seen and experienced and know in different states as well that for some reason, the Greeks, they love all bodies, all ages, especially in the diaspora and even Greece. Okay, but I'm going to speak for USA and more outside outside of Greece uh, countries. Uh, they will welcome you to perform at their restaurants, at their taverns, at their what? At the houses. <laughs> yes. But specifically those who are really looking to have opportunities for club work, right? Like Greek yeah. events, restaurants, taverns they love everybody they take like i've seen it like all body types all ages all everything so um so i mean yeah so you have so go to the greeks but i, 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 think final, I, I think i have to mention one thing finally i don't think i don't think we dance as much uh, as we used to in the past in general as a culture no i believe this i believe this well where I are you going? <laughs> I, I believe this we used to get together more often in well, the past well, Okay, no, we do go, but we're snobs. We just sit in the corner and with our nose up and looking at who's coming in and out. We used to dance more. We used to dance more. Hey, listen, I would love if we all were somewhere near together so we could actually dance with each other. It would be really great. Yeah. Uh, not, not only to just talk about the dance, but actually do it with different uh, dance forms. I'd like to thank all the panelists. I mean, you were you were terrific. You were fantastic. Thank, thank you so much for, for uh, this this fascinating discussion and uh i'd like to do it again in the future actually you know to just continue the thing to continue the dialogue to the audience uh, thank you again for being with us uh, join us in uh, january where we're going to have uh, an event this time called the journey and reflections on idra the island of idra uh the little quote little england uh thank you again to the panelists thank you again to the audience and have a beautiful uh, evening, afternoon, or whatever, depending on what time zone you're in. Thanks again. Thank you all.